In our last manscape, we looked at the growth of a port, the Port of Bristol. But ports don't just grow by themselves. They're there to handle goods, imports and exports. In this program, we look at some of those goods and the effects which bringing them in and out through a port had on the surrounding area. This may seem a peculiar place to talk about the imports and exports of a great seaport. But St. Mary Redcliffe, here in Bristol, is by far the largest and most spectacular symbol of the city's early prosperity. And that prosperity was based largely on one product, wool. During the Middle Ages, the export of wool and wool cloth became the main foundation of national wealth. The rich pastures of the west of England were ideal for sheep and Bristol was well placed to receive the wool and turn it into cloth for export. The craft guilds, they were sort of medieval trade unions, controlled the cloth industry. But much of the wealth of the cloth trade went not to the men who spun and wove the cloth, but into the private fortunes of merchants. By the 15th century, however, the woolen industry was leaving Bristol and moving from the city to the valleys of the surrounding area. This was partly because of the restrictive practices of the craft guilds. But much more important was the demand for power. The cloth made in Bristol was made entirely by hand. Once mechanical techniques were introduced, which needed power to drive them, the industry moved to where the power could be found, the fast-flowing streams of Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and North Somerset. These mills in places like Stroud and Bradford-on-Avon were the first factories. Different skills were brought together under one roof to work machines, often powered by water. Machines with curious names, Hargreaves' spinning jenny, Crompton's mule, and Arkwright's water frame. By the beginning of the last century, even the highly skilled weaver had been replaced by a machine. Automation had begun. Much of the wealth of both Bristol and Liverpool, and London too, came from profits made on cargoes which never even came to Britain. This was known as the triangular trade, and the cargoes were human beings. What happened was this. A merchant loaded cooking pots, pans, spirits, guns, trinkets, cloth, and sailed to West Africa. There he would exchange these goods for slaves, who had been captured by slave traders. The slaves would then be taken to the West Indies or the southern states of the American colonies and exchanged again, usually for rum, tobacco, sugar, cotton or timber. These goods, in their turn, were brought back to Britain. These are some of the goods which went out to West Africa. There was cloth, brass kettles like this one, and this bowl and dipper. These are made of Bristol brass. There was iron too, and cheap beads and trinkets. And there were guns. This is a flintlock pistol and a flintlock musket. A boy slave in Sierra Leone might cost seven kettles, like this, a few pieces of cloth and a bar of iron. A woman slave was rather less. Well, these are the goods which went out from Britain and these are what came back in return. There was cotton. Tobacco was important. This is leaf tobacco from Virginia and some of the clay pipes in which it was smoked. Then there was sugar, 
There's a loaf of sugar, a sugar loaf, made in Bristol from imported sugar. And, of course, there was rum. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, ships left Britain to engage in the slave trade. Here are the gory piazzas on the waterfront in Liverpool where many of the goods which were brought back in slave trade ships were stored. An average of 60 ships a, a year left Bristol to load slaves in West Africa and the memorials to this trade, still to be seen in Bristol and Liverpool, are the houses of merchants and ship owners and some of the fine civic buildings which came from their wealth. Several million slaves were shipped across the Atlantic from West Africa, and many thousands died on the journey from disease, hunger, or ill treatment. Conditions on the slave ships were appalling, and although it was in the merchants' interests to land healthy slaves, for they got better prices for them, very few bothered. These are some of the manacles in which the slaves were imprisoned. This would be fixed to a ring bolt in the side of the ship, and these went round the slaves' ankles. Conditions were appalling and eventually public opinion became so disgusted that slave trading was made illegal, although the use of slaves persisted until the 1860s in the United States, where its abolition was one of the causes of the Civil War. Very occasionally, Negroes were brought to Britain, not as slaves, but as servants in the houses of the merchants and ship owners. Here at Broad Quay, Bristol, is a typical scene of the 18th century with goods being brought back from the West Indies and unloaded on the quay. With the opening up of the Americas in the 16th century, to which Bristol contributed with John Cabot's voyage in the Matthew, new products were added to Bristol's long list of imports, of which wine, tobacco, cocoa and timber, especially logwood, used for making leather dyes, were the most important. This is Albert Mill on the River Chew at Canesham, the last of the logwood mills. It still has its water wheel here and some of the equipment inside it. The wheel isn't the original, that would probably have been made of wood. It's perhaps about a hundred years old and it's made of iron. Let's have a look at some of the details. This is a, a very sophisticated water wheel, designed to get the maximum amount of power out of the water available. These wrought iron buckets are very carefully shaped so that the water can be led in from the hatch just here, led in very efficiently into the bucket, and then it can pour out again as the wheel turns round. Just like the need for a, a good carburetor on a car, it was essential to have a good feed of water into the bucket to make sure that the wheel went round properly. The sides are of cast iron, the spokes here of wrought iron, and the power was taken off through a square cast iron shaft, through this coupling just here, and then into the mill itself. This shaft drove a whole mass of machinery in the mill. Cotton manufacture once thrived in Bristol as well. Here, beside the feeder canal along which the raw cotton was carried by barge from the city docks, stood the Great Western Cotton Factory. It employed over a thousand people at the peak of its prosperity in the second half of the 19th century. But the industry became dominated by the great mills in the north of England, and the business finally collapsed in 1929. The earliest cotton imports from the East Mediterranean and India had come into London, but with the end of the East India Company's monopoly, Liverpool enjoyed the benefit of access to North America for its raw material. Cotton growing had developed rapidly in the southern colonies of America, what were to become the southern states of the United States, and the trade in slaves contributed to this. Lancashire took this American cotton and grew rich.
why East Lancashire became so important is hard to tell, but availability of water for power and soft water for bleaching, dyeing and printing, and as steam engines were introduced, of coal for their boilers, were all significant. Equally important was the great and growing port of Liverpool, with its canal and railway connections with the hinterland. Initially, the links were by the Bridgewater Canal, later the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, and still later, the Manchester Ship Canal gave seagoing ships direct access. The Leeds and Liverpool Canal linked some of the northern cotton towns, and so along the eastern edge of Lancashire was this great cotton industrial area, Rochdale, Bolton, Oldham, and at the heart of it all, Manchester. Lancashire took over as the most important cotton manufacturing centre in the world and as far as the eye could see there were the great cotton mills and their chimneys. cotton was still imported through Bristol, Glasgow and a number of smaller ports, but Liverpool became the gateway to the Lancashire cotton industry, the world's largest cotton manufacturing area. Against this, Bristol could not compete, but she had other imports to keep her going. The earliest trade was in wine. Wine played a vital part in the development of Bristol from the Middle Ages. Much of that wine was stored in vaults below the buildings and streets of the city. And although most of them have now disappeared, a few, like this one, which is now a museum, can still be found. Here I am, under the streets of Bristol, in Harvey's wine cellars surrounded by hundreds of bottles of wine which have been shipped here from France, Spain and Portugal. How did the wine get into the bottle? Well, quite simply, a metal funnel was used, like that, and the wine would be poured in from a jug. But then, a machine was devised. Wine would be fed into this trough, and by placing a bottle on this pipe, like that, the wine would siphon from the trough into the bottle. You can see that there are a whole range of pipes and bottles. It's a form of bottling production line. So that when the last bottle is placed on here, the first one at this end is full. All that then had to be done was to put the cork in the bottle. Wine importing gave rise to another important Bristol industry the making of glass bottles. And although Bristol has become most famous for beautiful blue glass, like this, throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, most of its output was of ordinary green bottles like these. Glass bottles and window glass were made in a special building called a glass cone. And I'm sitting in one now. It doesn't look much like a factory because this one's been converted into the restaurant of a large hotel. You can see on the wall over there some of the tools of the industry and some illustrations of what used to go on here. 
important had the glass industry become in Bristol that by the beginning of the 19th century, the skyline of the city, which for hundreds of years had been dominated by church spires, had sprouted almost as many glass cones. Bristol is still dominated by tobacco warehouses, however, where tobacco leaf is held in bond, that is, before any duty is paid on it. Here, on the top floor of one of the great bonded warehouses, tobacco leaf is sorted, graded and weighed before being taken out of bond and sent to the factory. The tobacco industry in Bristol dates back to about 1600, but it was not until the new popularity of the cigarette that it began to grow in size. By then, most of the Bristol tobacco industry was run by two brothers, William Day Wills and Henry Overton Wills from which the present company of W.D. and H.O. Wells takes its name. They started trading from this shop in the heart of the city. Then, in the 1860s, new factories were opened in Bedminster. And it's here that perhaps the most famous cigarette of all time was made, the Wild Woodbine. Sold in packets of five for a penny and immortalized in the First World War, Woodbines were sent in huge numbers to troops in the trenches of France and Flanders. Pack up your troubles in your own kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you a Lucifer to light your fang, smile boys, that's the sign. What's the use of... Further growth has now led the company to move out to these new, more spacious premises. Even though attitudes to smoking have changed, tobacco is still a major industry in Bristol today. The same sort of thing happened with chocolate. Originally located in the Wine Street area of Bristol, chocolate making grew in importance and eventually occupied a large factory in Union Street, where one of the first steam engines in Bristol was used to drive the machinery. J.S. Fry and Sons have now moved out to this modern, purpose-built factory. Today, nothing remains of the original works in Bristol. The common thread through all we have seen has been the ports where we began our story, and the industries which grew out of them. Around Bristol, some, like chocolate, tobacco and wine importing, still thrive, but in Lancashire, the cotton trade produced new communities who had no other form of livelihood. As the cotton trade declines, what happens to these people and the manscapes in which they live? <laughs>